Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stew again, and this time we're going to be working with MM's Ancient Times kit and my scene, The Lost Valley of the Ancients, to bring some life to your scene by adding a simple dial puzzle. The scene featured in this video is currently available in the Dreamiverse as The Lost Valley of the Ancients. It is fully remixable and does currently contain all of the changes you will see here. The first thing we need to do is build the prop for our puzzle. I will be using two assets from the MM Ancient Times Art Kit to do this. They are stone steps and the ubiquitous round stone platform. Our main console is constructed of the bottom side of two stone steps. Side by each, the dials will be round stone platforms. We will have four dials total in this example. Two will be the code we want the player to duplicate. And those will be immobile. The other two will be the dials that the player will be turning. There are about a million different ways to accomplish this. This is just one way of doing it, so please view this as a starting point and use your imagination and ingenuity to guide your choices from there. We need some indicators on the dials to show the orientation. I will use stone steps to accomplish that. Once those are placed, group them up with the round stone platforms to create a dial that will move together as we rotate them. A smarter way to do this would have been to make one dial and then duplicate it three times, but this is how I roll. Once those are done, we'll rotate our top objectives into place and then set the player turnable dials to the exact opposite position. You can have as many dials as you want, you can set them however you want. The reason you see this in games is because it's an easy mechanic and it scales nicely. I'm going to determine that our turnable dials are in the correct position with the trigger zone, so I need something to trigger the trigger zone. I'll use stone steps again, and we'll put this one out a little further in line with our dial indicator. In the final version, these zone triggers will be invisible, but you want to make that the last step because you want to be able to see them while you're building the thing. Also important to note, I'm copying these within the scope of the group for each of the movable dials because we want them to move with the rest of the dial as they turn. We'll go into the menu for each one of those zone triggers and give them a label under the Labels and Ownership tab. I like to use the Machine label for stuff like this. You can choose any label you like, but you only want one and you want to make sure it doesn't conflict with other labels you may be using in the scene. The prop is built and now we want to add some logic to it. We will start with a microchip so we can keep everything organized. As mentioned, we'll use a couple of trigger zones to figure out when our dials are in the correct position. We'll go into the trigger zones, grab the little white dot and move those into place. Notice I'm placing those to correspond to the position of the objective dials up top. You want these zones to be fairly small to avoid false positives, but as large as possible to err on the side of caution. Once those are in place, they need to know what to detect. Well, we've set up the zone triggers with the machine label, so of course these trigger zones will want to look for machine labels. Under the Labels tab of the trigger zones, make sure only machine is selected. Now let's set up our keyframes. We'll have four for each dial, one for each cardinal position, just to keep things simple. The first keyframe will be the initial position of the dial. The order of the others is not important, but when you wire everything up later, you want to make sure you switch between them in a rotational order so they don't jump around. When you're rotating this into place while recording the keyframes, try to keep them from wandering too much so you don't end up with jerky animations. You don't need to be exactly perfect. Usually some wobble and overshoot adds character. You just want to avoid so much that the animation looks broken. And then repeat the process with the second dial, but remember to make the first one your starting position. That way it's easier to remember when you wire it up later. We don't have any imps in this scene, so I'm electing to handle this with button presses rather than imp grabs. We'll use the keyframes to change the orientation of the dials on button press. Before we get to that though, I have to set up the device so that it knows when it's being interacted with. We need to do this because of the choice to use button presses. This requires us to disable at least some controls in the character and then enable their use with the puzzle. <laughs> 
We will do this with another trigger zone. The zone will be set to detect the player in an area in front of the device. This way it stays inactive until the player approaches it. We will also need a player controller to facilitate the actions upon button press once the player is in the zone to activate the device. Setup for this is very simple. We only need three outputs on this, one each for clockwise rotation, counterclockwise rotation, and to switch dials. I'm going to hook up the detected output from the main trigger zone to the power of the controller sensor. That way these controls are only active while we're working on this puzzle. Under the Imp Portant Properties tab of the controller sensor, I'm going to select Remote Controllable. We don't need or want to possess this, but we do want to control it. At the same time, we want to make sure the controls in the character are disabled. There are various reasons for this, but the main one is that the puzzle is what we want to focus on while this is active and nothing else. I'm going to use a wireless transmitter. We'll hook that up to send a signal when the main trigger zone for the puzzle device is active, and then we'll put a receiver for that in the character. Here's the controller sensor in the character. We're going to place our wireless receiver here and then wire that up to the power of the character controller sensor. Since the signal coming from the puzzle will be off unless we're using the puzzle, we want to flip this with a NOT gate. That way the character controller sensor is active when the puzzle is NOT in use. Let's drop in some selector gadgets so we can switch between states on these dials. We need three selectors, one so we can switch between dials and then one for each dial so we can switch between keyframe positions. Ignore the wiring on these selectors for now. I screwed it all up at this juncture. We will address this later when we have some fun bug hunting. I'm reorganizing keyframes a little so they're easier to hook up. You want your default keyframe to be the initial position so you'll hook the A output of the selector up to the power of that one. You can then hook up the rest similarly. It's important to note that the keyframe position must also be in order so B must be a quarter turn right or left of A, C must be a quarter turn in the same direction from B, and D from C. I'll set up the other dial the same way. You can have as many positions as you want. I picked four because it's simple and visually there's no ambiguity. I also want to point out if you know which keyframe is the correct one, you can simply use the output of the selector to indicate a correct choice instead of the way we initially set this up with trigger zones. I didn't realize this until making the video, but as I said earlier, there are almost always a bunch of different ways to do the same thing. You'll only need to emphasize doing things the most efficient way when resources are tight. In almost every other circumstance, it's fine to be a little sloppy as long as it works. We're going to hook this up so that the puzzle is complete when the dials are in the correct position. For that, we want an AND gate, so signal only flows when both conditions are met. This will allow us to have the puzzle do something when it's done, and also return control back to the character. I've set some doors up at the top of the stairs. We'll keyframe those so they open when the puzzle is finished, thereby providing a reason for the puzzle to exist, and incentive to solve it. The first keyframe is to set initial position. The second keyframe is the open position. You may have noticed that destroyer gadget. Ignore that for now, we'll get back to it in a second. We'll add a selector to switch between the two states on the gates at the top of the stairs. At this point I realize I want the open state to be persistent, so I need to offload that logic from this microchip so that isn't destroyed. Another thing that occurs to me is that since the microchip holding all of this logic is surface snapped to our puzzle, that destroyer will remove the puzzle from the scene completely, which I don't want, so I'm going to reorganize and bear with me. At this point I've removed the main microchip for the puzzle from the surface of the puzzle to ensure that there are no unwanted side effects due to the surface snap. 
I've also made a new separate microchip to hold the things I want to keep persistent and separate from the puzzle, like the gate's keyframe and the destroyer. Sorry for any confusion here. If you have questions, please ask in the comments. At this point, I've started playtesting this and have run into a bunch of problems. So now I'll get around to wiring a working version. We need a wire running from the button presses for turning the dials to the move to next output and move to previous output input tabs on each dial selector. However, we want to be able to interrupt those signals when the other dial is active, so we'll run those signals through nodes. The output from the selector that switches between dials will then run to the power of the nodes. In this way, when one dial is active, it will keep the other dial from responding to player input that rotates the dials. And as you can see here, since B is the active output on the selector that switches between dials, the nodes going to the upper dial selector are, are off, thereby keeping that selector from changing. One issue I ran into while playtesting that's worth pointing out is that the trigger zones were not responding to the labeled zone triggers on the dials, and that was because I had turned their collision off. In the trigger zone, labels tab, the trigger zones are set to only detect collidable object labels by default. So you have to be careful of nuances like that. Another issue was that the main puzzle trigger zone would detect the player controller and then disable it. This would then cause the trigger zone to not detect the player controller, which would re-enable it in a loop, which is the flickering gadgets you're seeing. To fix that, I just put a tag on the player, which is probably a good idea anyway, and then set the main trigger zone to detect th the tag. The whole setup is close to functioning properly, so I start to work on details. By default, keyframes don't have any sort of smoothing on, so when you activate them, the dials abruptly jump from place to place. You want this to look more like the dial is turning, which you can accomplish by adjusting the slow power up and slow power down sliders in the keyframes. 0.2 seconds was okay, but I'm still working on the final product. I also enabled keep changes on all of these just to avoid any unexpected behavior. There's a camera controller in the controller sensor, but I'm adding a camera gadget so I have a little more control. Normally this entire situation would require a cutscene for introduction. This video is quite long with just the puzzle being added, so I'll put that in later. If you want to see the cutscene process, you can check out my video on the switch mechanic, or one specifically I made in this series for cutscenes. Check out the cards for those. While our Puzzle scenario is active, we want to provide the player with some guidance about the puzzle control scheme, so I will add some text displayers. One text displayer tip I'd like to give you is to turn on the grid at 1 32nd scale before you place any text displayers in the screen layer. This makes it much easier to line them up and keep them lined up. I recommend 1 32nd because larger scales tend to be chunkier and more difficult to work with. There are probably a few different ways to exit from this scenario, but the way I opted to do it is by destroying everything that keeps the player in it. So the big one is the main trigger zone for the puzzle. I'll go ahead and get rid of the controller sensor too just to be safe, and the text displayers as well. I won't destroy the entire microchip because there are certain things you want to keep for the sake of continuity like the last position of the dials. I'll add a couple more keyframes so that we have a visual indication of which dial is active and that's accomplished as easily as adding some glow to the dial. You only need one keyframe per dial and then make sure you do not have keep changes ticked on the keyframe. That way you revert to normal when it isn't active. Those keyframes are then wired up to the output of the dial changing selector which runs to their power. One of the tricky parts in this type of setup is keeping track of which dial is which and what turn direction is what, and naturally I reversed both. So just something to keep in mind. When I put out the final product, this stuff will be cleaned up and well labeled so there isn't any confusion on my part or yours.
And we're almost done, but I want to point out an error that stayed in to the very end without consequence. These two wires coming from the main trigger zone and running into the dial change selector are unnecessary and potentially dangerous. When the selector is powered, it will output from the active selection regardless of input. You would use the inputs when you want to activate a specific output. In this case, since there are only two possible selections and both of those inputs are wired, I believe they're canceling each other out. However, this wiring is incorrect. Neither of those connections should have been made and there should be nothing running into the A or B inputs on this selector. I'll have that cleared up in the final product, but let's finally see the dial puzzle sequence in action. I could have probably made that glow more obvious and it is painfully lacking in sound, but those issues are fixed easily enough. Animation needs some fine tuning, but again, that's a fairly simple fix. And finally, we solve the puzzle, pat and head through the gates onto the next phase of this scene. So in this video, we learned how to make a simple dial puzzle and add one more element that can bring life to our scene. Plenty more videos coming. I was reminded recently about making tiling elements using live cloning, so I want to show you that. But that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you in the Dreamiverse.